My name's Anne Johnson. I am at the um, incoming Vice President International of the Academy of Medical Sciences. So it's a great pleasure to be able here, to be here this evening to welcome you on what's the first uh, international lecture I've uh, uh, been able to attend in this capacity, which is great. So welcome to the Academy of Medical Sciences and Lancet International Health Lecture. This is a very special lecture which we host uh, once a year, and it's a highlight of the Academy's um, annual uh, program. The Academy of Medical Sciences is the UK's National Academy for Medical Science. We pride ourselves in being a very diverse group from basic science through to public health and global health. And indeed, the Academy's program of international health grows annually um, in, in its breadth and its depth. And I think we are delighted to be working both across the UK, but more broadly with colleagues across the world. The Lancet has hosted this lecture with us over the last three years, and we're delighted that they are partners in this endeavor, although the lecture goes back to 2004. I think all of you know that Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, who is here with us this, e this evening, along with several of his colleagues from The Lancet, have really been leaders in the field of global health, in the field of planetary health, and I think have encouraged us to think a great deal about the many international challenges that face us uh, globally. And Richard, in fact, has championed the uh, thinking about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goal, Goals, and particularly the, qu the question of universal health coverage, which will be part of the subject of this evening's lecture. I'm going to leave it to Richard to welcome and introduce our speaker this evening, so I'll say no more about that now, although there is indeed a, a wonderful um, article being published on the basis of this evening's lecture, which I think will be available to you later, and I um, had a preview, so I, I really recommend that to you. The lecture is being live streamed, and a video, a video of the lecture will be available on the website after the event if you want to go back to it, or even if you want to pass on that link to colleagues. We will be hearing from uh, our lecturer this evening for about 50 minutes, and then Richard Horton will be hosting a Q&A for around 30 minutes, and um, I'm, I'm sure you will all participate in that vigorously. And after that, there will be a drinks, re uh, drinks reception with canapes outside. I am asked to remind, I don't have to do this thing about you know, where the exits are. I've always wanted to practice that, and the, where your flotation device is and all that, but I won't do that piece. But um, you know where the exits are. And um, uh, to remind you, please, to switch off your m mobile phones to silent, because uh, there is, um, we are, you are encouraged to participate in the debate using Twitter, using the hashtag IHL2018. I don't know if that's up there. Um, there is a Wi-Fi uh, for the venue if you, if you uh, want, to, want to use it, but I don't think you'll be needing that, obviously, because you'll be gripped by the content, but we hope you will use Twitter if you so wish to. And um, uh, we look forward uh, very much to this evening's lecture. It now leaves me to pass over to Professor, Professor Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet, to introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you, Richard. Thanks so much, Anne. It's such a pleasure and privilege to be collaborating with you uh, and the Academy of Medical Sciences, who are our wonderful partners in this endeavor. Um, the Academy of Medical Sciences, Europe's leading medical science academy. Uh, it's my delight and honor to introduce Dr. Irene Agapong, um, who will deliver this evening's Academy of Medical Sciences Lancet International Health Lecture. And the title of her lecture is Universal Health Coverage, Global Policy Agenda Breakthrough, or Great White Elephant. So very provocative. And indeed, as Anne says, her lecture will be appearing on our website the moment she finishes speaking. <laughs> so uh, I would encourage you and urge you to read it um, with diligence and to write us lots of angry letters telling us how much you agree or disagree with what she says. Dr. Agipong is a medical doctor who studied at the University of Ghana Medical School. She received her doctorate in public health from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and she's an honorary professor uh, 
in the Division of Health Systems and Policy at the University of Cape Town. Currently, she is Director of the Health Services uh, for the Greater Accra region in Ghana, uh, where she also has a responsibility in a secondment to the University of Ghana School for Public Health, where she has taught and supervised students since its opening in 1994. She has had a series of illustrious appointments in global health. Between 2008 and 2010, she held the Prince Klaus Chair in Development and Equity at the University Medical Center of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Between 2012 and 2014, she was the first chair of the Board of Health Systems Global. She previously has been the chair of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee, STAC, of the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research. And she's also been a member of the US National Academy of Sciences Commission on creating a global health risk framework for the future. In 2008, Irene was awarded the Arnold Kaluzny Distinguished Alumni Award from the Public Health Leadership Program at the University of North Carolina. And currently, she occupies two exceptionally important roles which distinguishes her in giving this lecture this evening. First, she is currently a member of the Independent Advisory Committee of the Global Burden of Disease and even more importantly than that, she sits on WHO's expert reference group, providing scientific advice to Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, for his 13th global program of work, one of whose goals is to expand access to universal health coverage for another 1 billion people on our planet by 2023. We have had particular pleasure in working with Irene at The Lancet, she was the first author last year of The Lancet Commission on the Future of Health in Sub-Saharan Africa. And just two weeks ago, it was announced that she is co-chairing our Lancet Commission on synergies between universal health coverage, health security, and health promotion. You will find on the Academy of Medical Sciences a brief interview with Irene, and I want to quote her from the first question that she was asked. And the question was, what motivates you? My interest in health inequalities, she said, arose from working first in a district hospital and then up through all levels of the Ghana Health Service. The stories have never left me. Some are tales of triumph, others unnecessary tragedies of missing resources and system failures. Rather than throw up my hands and despair, I made a quiet pledge not to forget and to make a difference whenever I could. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Irene Agyapong. Um, thank you, Richard, and thank you, and um, what can I say? <laughs> um, I'm honored to be able to give this lecture tonight. Um, okay. I'll start with a story. It's one of the many stories which have never left me. And it's a story that starts in the clinic, but it ends in the community. Um, I finished medical school in the 80s in Ghana. It was a very difficult time. In fact, one of my colleagues is sitting here, so she knows what I'm talking about. And I, I, but I wanted to see more of my own country than the teaching hospital where I'd been trained. So I accepted a posting to the central region. It was only three hours, three, four hours from Accra, but it was very different. And over the course of that year, there were many cases and many stories. But I'm going to tell this particular one. I was... Um, in the clinic, when the matron came to me very agitated, you've got to drop everything. Come, follow me now. So, I mean, 
Matron was the kind of person who, when she says, come follow me now, and you kind of almost go, yes, ma'am, and <laughs> run. So I followed her. And she said, I said, what is it? As I followed her, she said, the old lady has tied her daughter's medicines in the corner of her cloth and is refusing to give them to her. So we have not been able to administer the medication. Now, this was a young woman who had been brought in very late from one of the many remote communities where we often got cases is very late, very bad. She delivered at home. She was, you know, almost semi-conscious, running high temperatures. Our lab was very rudimentary, but the clinical science suggested she had septicemia, and we needed to get antibiotics in and get them in fast. And the 80s were a very difficult time in Ghana. We just entered IMF structural adjustment. In theory, the government was providing everything free. In practice, there was very little and we would give people prescriptions. Go buy this and go buy that. So we got then this old lady. She was totally impassive, no sign of emotion. And I said, mother, you know, why have you tied your daughter's medicines? You know, we really need them. There's hope this child could live. And she says, I'm old. I've seen death, and I know death when I see it. This child has crossed beyond where we can help her. There are many mouths to feed. There's very little money. The young ones were emotional. That's why they spent the little money on this medicine. I need to return it so that we can continue to eat. That was a difficult one. But I, I still said, mother, there's a chance your granddaughter would live. So she finally gave the medicines back to us. It was more our importunity than conviction I could see on her face. We started the treatment. The girl died that night. We gave the medicines back to her. That story continued to haunt me. I couldn't quite figure out what this was all about. A few months, about a year later, I accepted a posting as a district medical officer to a remote, you know, rural community. There were no hospitals, just a few clinics. And I started spending time in the community trying to understand the people, their health problems, the wider determinants of health. And the more time I spent in the community, the more I began to wonder again about this old lady because I saw a level of poverty I had not seen before. I saw economies where even one CD in Ghana is maybe 20p, and it seemed like a lot of money to people. And it, it, it just haunted me that, you know, does it, is it really the way to do things that people have to find money out of pocket at the time they need care? Is there no other way? I've started with this story to put um, this lecture in context. The, I'll add another story and then I'll move on. I said I became what we call a district medical officer. This was in 1989. At that time, the major global theme was immunize the world's children by 1990. It was part of what was called selective primary health care, growth monitoring, oral rehydration, breastfeeding, infant immunization. Again, as I worked over the months, I was struck by the abundance of resources to immunize and save the children in the communities where we worked, and the lack of resources to tackle all the myriad other things, which still meant some of them died anyway. So would have the cars and would have the fuel and would have the pressure and would go and immunize all these children. And the same child would be malnourished or they would have diarrhea. And there were not quite enough resources to deal with that. Again, it set me wondering, what was the world looking for? Was the world really wanting to save these children? Or did the world just want glossy statistics about you know, how we had achieved a target? So I, I set my lecture in the context of these two stories. And I, I think as I go on, I'll keep coming back to them. 
in 2015, the, the, and it's the UN came out with the Sustainable Development Goals and all the UN member states signed on to it. That was refreshing. You know, it had a very comprehensive social justice theme, you know, leave no one behind, transforming the world, an agenda for sustainable development. And w Sustainable Development Goal 3, has one, as one of its sub goals achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential health care, safe, effective, quality, affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. I think it's refreshing from the stories I've told you. This is right up my street. I was very mm -hmm. happy to see this. But I kept wondering, based on some of the experiences I've already told you about, what implementation pathways will play out for this agenda? Is it really going to be allowed to be a breakthrough agenda, or is the world going to end up with a great white elephant? Mm. Uh, you know, what can we learn from an analysis of the past? And from the, by the past, I'm referring to since the coming into effect of the WHO Constitution in 1948, because that, that was the point at which the world said, yes, let's come together. We need this organization to help us tackle global health. What is a breakthrough? A breakthrough is an important discovery. It's an event that helps to improve a situation that provides an answer to a problem. Universal health coverage could be that. What is a white elephant? <laughs> <laughs> it's a possession that is useless or troublesome. Mm -hmm. And it's expensive to maintain and difficult to dispose of. And its costs are out of proportion to its usefulness. In fact, the term comes from Southeast Asia. Owning a white elephant was you know, a sign of prestige and honor and a monarch's reign that would be blessed. And if you were given such a gift, that was an honor indeed. But being a sacred animal, it wasn't allowed to work. And you had to feed it and maintain it and you couldn't give it away. So my question is, what is the world going to do with UHC? We've all signed on the dotted line, the member states of the United Nations. So we've accepted that possession. Are we going to let it be a breakthrough that transforms our world, or is it going to, by 2020, turn out to have been an expensive and a troublesome beast we couldn't get rid of? To answer the question, I, want, I, I, I did a qualitative exploration of patterns and trends in global health agendas, as well as health agendas in Ghana over the seven decades since the World Health Organization came into being. The constitution of the World Health Organization says that its objective is the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. So that's why I chose the WHO. Ghana I chose because I come from Ghana. My working life has been in Ghana. It's a low middle income country. Ghana is also a leader in universal health coverage in Africa and I'll talk about it. Then to answer the question, I've picked um, concepts from political economy and also from health systems as complex adaptive systems. The concepts I've picked from political economy are the idea of institutions, interests, ideologies, and ideas as determinants of health policy processes and outcomes. And then regarding health systems as complex adaptive system, a complex adaptive system is a system in which the parts are interlinked and in which the sum of the parts are greater than the sum of the whole. So you can think of it as all of us seated in this room are connected to each other by invisible strings. At a superficial glance, it looks like it's easy to rearrange this room if you don't discern those strings. But as soon as you move one person, other people start moving in a very confusing and unpredictable manner. I could compare it to raising a child. Even if you have, you've raised 10 children, you can never assume that the 11th child is going to be exactly the same. Children are complex. 
which is very different from the simple process of putting a key in a lock and opening a door. And that's what health systems are like. They are path dependent, they are history matters, they are unpredictable to varying degrees. Networks are skill free. Networks being skill free means they are not random. You, you have particular, um, some, there are particular nodes, connections, which are more important than other connections. The four concepts of ideology, interest, and ideas. What do I mean by ideology? By ideology, I'm talking about core assumptions, values, and worldviews. They are underlying normative positions. We may not sometimes explicitly recognize it, but we all have underlying ideologies. The way we believe the world is, the way we believe the world should work. And it affects a lot of things, even when it's implicit rather than explicit. I was doing very well till now. Okay. <laughs> okay. What are ideas? Ideas are specific solutions, you know, programs and interventions that we, we select to resolve problems. Universal health coverage is an idea. There are usually several rather than one idea in, in circulation as solutions for a given problem. But we end up settling on one because often you cannot solve a problem with a myriad of solutions depending on the nature of the problem. So in looking at global health and health in Ghana over time, I, I speak about dominant ideas, the ideas that rise to the top of all the ideas circulating. doesn't mean the other ideas go away, but these preferentially rise to the top. And then by institutions, I'm talking of structures as well as mechanisms and rules of social order that govern behavior. And it can be formal and it can be informal. Formal institutions are explicitly created by authorities with the power to do so. So the Ministry of Health Ghana is an institution. WHO is an institution. So that's what I mean by institutions. I'm, I'm going to keep referring to this issue of ideas, ideology, institutions, and interests. So I, I just go over it now. And then you have interests. By interests, we are talking of actors and stakeholders and what they perceive as well as what they actually stand to lose or gain by the formal and informal arrangements of given institutions as well as the adoption of given ideas. And that is why often policy is such a contested process. Um, no, I don't want to go to some of the controversial ones. I've been listening to the news in recent days. I was going to talk about the contestation in the US, but that's really controversial. <laughs> but basically, it's a reflection of the way. That's, it's precisely because people have different underlying ideologies, different ideas as to how the world should run, different interests, that often what looks like a simple and obvious decision becomes contested and murky because we, 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 we are coming at it from different points. So what do you find? Basically, in global health over time, you'll notice that roughly that there seems to be two tracks of ideology and ideas. You have the selective or vertical, and you have the systems or horizontal. Now, the selective or vertical basically says that it is not possible within available resources to address all the myriad of issues and interventions that we need to do to bring about health <laughs> status improvement. So let's focus on selected and justified priorities where we are sure we have technologies that can provide rapid improvements. And that there tends to be, the discussions tend to focus around efficiency, cost benefit, cost effectiveness. I gave the example of when I started work as a district medical officer in 1989, and I met Immunize the World's Children by 1990. This is an example of a selective vertical ideology. If you look at the history of the World Health Organization, after I it was set up in the first decade or so, there were a lot of campaigns, you know, and some of them were very successful. The world got rid of smallpox. 
the world filled with malaria. There were all campaigns, selective campaigns. Then you have the systems or horizontal ideology, which says you can't sustainably improve health without addressing the systems that are needed to support health improvement. Even if you want to immunize children, you need health workers, you need transport, you, you need to organize outreach, you need to engage communities. So strengthen systems as a foundation on which sustainable interventions and health improvement can rest. People often talk about social justice, health as a human right. This is a very simplistic dichotomy, but you'll find it underlying arguments and debates and decisions in global health over time. And I've taken this quote from Gonzalez in 1965 to show that it has nothing much has changed. You know, he says, among the many important problems facing the developing nations of the world is that of the health of their populations. And there are two possible approaches to the problem of health in such countries. One is to build up a framework of health services able in due course to cope with the prevalent diseases. The other is to attack the principal diseases by mass campaigns. It's the same he dichotomy I'm talking about. And you see it running through. There is, in theory, a third ideology, which I call slanted, which is neither exclusively focused on building systems or exclusively focused on selective interventions, but trying to do both. And again, generally, this tends to manifest at country level. I'll come back to it again. And you'll find that governments focus their resources on building the system. Donors focus their resources on selective interventions. And somehow, people try to manage the two together. OK. My observation working in Ghana over the years has been that it is the slanted sits uneasily. Because what happens is, let's say you have a, a, a development person or a donor who wants to focus on immunization. They say, I want my resources to be used to immunize children. Government says, I want to develop my systems. There are often conditionalities attached will give you free vaccines, but you have to provide a certain percentage of the cost of immunizing the children. So you, you get these uneasy tensions, even when you have a slanted approach. And my observation has been that what happens is that in some cases, for example, I don't know if you remember the Bamako initiative, that also set off in the 90s. Uh, my district was one of the pilots. I remember when the initiative came, the senior um, public health officials in the Ministry of Health who had been, you know, they'd been there since Alma Atta, they'd seen things come and go. They were all saying, uh -uh, this is not going to work. But they still said, yes. Since you want to do this, welcome, let's give it a try. And what, hap what, happened, what happens with programs like that is that as soon as the special funding ceases, because there's no anchor in the country, the program is allowed to die. Others, like the expanded program on immunization, the health sector bought into it. But then after 1990, they started making arguments that you've got to integrate this into our systems. It has to become part of our routine systems. We are tired of mass campaigns. And once those arguments were accepted and it was integrated, you saw it becoming a part of the system, and everybody took it for granted, and it, be and it has endured to now. So, so that's, that's been my observation. Unfortunately, at the global level, it looks like the system approaches that are of such concern at country level are not of the same, sometimes. So if you take primary health care, it was framed 
as a very comprehensive agenda, community participation, rights to health, then it was gradually reframed into the selective agenda I talked about. What about the national level in Ghana? What has happened from 1948 through to now? They are, doc they are actually documents. Some of them were hard to find. You had to go to libraries where they have archived copies. But it was, they are very interesting documents to read. For example, if you look at the Maud Commission Report of 1952, it actually recommended that you need to develop a proper health service if you want health to improve in Ghana. And the colonial government in 1952, Ghana was still a, a British colony um, transitioning to independence. The colonial government accepted those recommendations and the whole focus of national health development was on developing a health system. So for example, from 89 doctors in government service in 1952, there were 141 by 1960, 232 by 1961, Wherever the decisions were being made within country, the emphasis was on systems building. After the MOD report, the next one was a 10-year health program for Ghana, 1961 to 1970. Um, again, it continued that focus, and these are very long documents, but when you read them, the arguments are all in there. You need to develop an overall health system. You need to improve access. You need to integrate hospitals, health centers, and, and other medical units. And then there was the recurring theme of you need to address the social determinants of health. In fact, the 1961, the Bradshaw's report said, in the long run, a sound food and nutrition policy and national water supplies and sewerage program are at least as important for the health of the people as the building of hospitals and clinics. This is before the Social Determinants of Health Commission in WHO several decades later. In up to the 70s, all this was assumed to be that it would be funded by taxes, government taxes. Services in the public sector since independence had been predominantly financed from general taxes, very low out-of-pocket fees. But now Ghana's economy, which was growing very slowly, stagnated. Through the 70s and the 80s, it stagnated. And it was the same story across many low and middle income countries. And it was worsened by, it's, it's long ago, but you had all this oil crisis and so on. It really hit many low and middle income countries hard. So people started now thinking about financing the system. It had not been a major issue. The issue had been access, access, access. But now the attention turned to financing. So you had the 1970 Konita Hulu report, which now looked at how do we finance this access that we are trying to improve. And again, I quote portions of the report because even back in 1970, people had started now thinking through, is there any other way beyond general taxes, beyond out-of-pocket fees? So, you ha so the, the report mentioned that a good national health insurance scheme is the envy of most countries. And it used national health insurance not for any particular model, because sometimes people are focused on models. Is it the beverage UK model or the German model? No. This just said, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing to have. The UK has a system, it finances it by taxes. Germany has a system, it finances it, you know, by social insurance contributions, that's not the issue. The issue is that a good national health insurance scheme is the envy of most countries. But the report also said that the primary problem in developing countries like Ghana was the system, the shortage of doctors, of nurses, of infrastructure, and that it is impossible to implement health insurance or get universal coverage without finding a solution to this primary problem. So 
the report suggested explore progressive approaches, but keep trying to build a system, keep trying to build universal access, and also introduce some user fees. The, the report was accepted, the efforts on building access con continued, but user fees were not introduced at a high level because it was recognized that they might defeat that very purpose of creating access. Roll forward to the 1980s and things were really bad. They got so bad that Ghana entered a classic IMF structural adjustment program and user fees, significant user fees were part of it. Now, I, um, the program has been maligned. I agree it was very inequitable, but one also has to recognize that without the introduction of those user fees and without people meeting those inequities, you would not have had the social groundswell because this was now a social grassroots movement that we are suffering. These fees are a problem. And it kept the, 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 the it kept go, people kept talking. These fees are a problem. There were horror stories. So then it pushed decision makers to start looking for alternatives. There has to be an alternative. And in fact, there was an interesting report which showed that with the introduction of user fees, utilization dropped drastically. In urban areas, it recovered a bit. In rural areas, it never recovered. And the question was, all these people who have stopped using the system, is it because they were frivolous users or simply because they can't afford services they need? Okay. Another thing which happened through the 80s and the 90s was the sector-wide approach. Again, it was a pushback against vertical programs. People were getting tired. You had myriads of programs. I remember as a district medical officer, the last week of every month, I couldn't get half the nurses to look at my face. They were all writing reports. The UNICEF report, the World Bank report, the WHO report, you know, the DFID report. Anybody who gave you money wanted their own report. And it was a drain on the system. So in the 90s, there was a pushback that, please, can we sit down and have one common program of work? And can we have one basket fund? And can we work together? The pushback worked, and that led to the sector-wide approach. It worked for some time. Still in the same period of the 90s, um, and you also have to superimpose the contextual issues. I've talked about the economics. There was also the politics. Ghana moved from a military government in 1992 to another attempt at multi-party democracy with the Fourth Republic. Now, the reason why this matters for health is that with the move to multi-party democracy, the social discontent over user fees became more important because the rulers had to go back to the electorate every four years to be given the mandate to keep ruling. And then people started writing manifestos and looking for what would catch attention, what would draw votes. And one of the things that caught attention was this issue of user fees and the social agitation over the injustice of it and the fact that people died because they didn't have money and so on. So in 2000, it became a major election campaign promise. I'm spending a bit of time on this because one of my conclusions will be that actually if you want sustainable change, the lead and the impetus has to come from within country. You cannot drive innovative and sustainable change at country level globally. So this was being driven on three fronts. On one front, it was being driven by the political change. On another front, it was being driven by the social agitation. And on the third front, knowledge had accumulated. I mentioned the fact that um, even within the public service bureaucracy, there was recognition that user fees were a problem. In 1992, in Nkranza, a Catholic mission hospital in the Brongahafu region, 
because the, the, the staff were facing so many problems, like my old lady problem, you know, they, they wanted a way out and they worked with a Dutch NGO <laughs> called Memisa to pilot an insurance scheme so that at least people who were admitted for inpatient care didn't have to pay if they were part of the insurance scheme. That was 1992. In that same year, the year before, I, I was doing my master's in Liverpool, my master's in community health, and the director for medical services came to the UK, and he came to Liverpool, and he said, you know, the, the, the user fees thing is not sustainable. It's highly inequitable. We need to find another way. We are not generating enough taxes. We have to explore insurance. Could you team up with your colleague who's doing her PhD in the London School and is looking at, is insurance at all feasible? It sounds odd in 2018 to say this was the question, but in 1991, the general opinion was health insurance, low-income country, impossible. Can you do team up and just see, is this feasible? Is there any way that this could be a way forward? So. At the same time that Incronza started their experiment, we also started research in the district where I worked. The initial research was just finding out in the community, is it at all possible? What concepts do you have of risk sharing? In fact, the response was overwhelmingly enthusiastic. So then we started working, and it was very grassroots work, sitting in communities, talking to people. How could we make this work in a district where there are no hospitals? Where do you go when you need a hospital and things like that? Unfortunately, midway through this, and again, we come back to this issue of interests, ideas, ideologies. The director for medical services who believed in evidence-driven decision-making and research retired. His successor thought we were wasting our time with community grassroots research. And he decided to invest in a, pi and a different kind of pilot. Whatever it is, that failed, but the evidence that that didn't work was also there. So by 2000, you had within country evidence as well as global evidence that yes, maybe there was a way. So. When one of the two parties, who, and they made the promise not knowing exactly how they will execute it, which is, I think, the way most of the politics goes. It's never very clear exactly how it will be executed, but we think it can be done. So what they did is they invited anybody and everybody who had an idea within country. And that is how the Ghana National Health Insurance Scheme was born. And the other thing is that because of the skepticism at that time, many donors in country thought this is impossible. But because of the pressure of the electorate and the election promise, the government said, even if you think it's impossible, we are going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I've spent a lot of time on this story. I, I'm stopping here, but I think it's central to the point I'm trying to make about the importance of getting leadership from within country rather than trying to move action globally. So this, the, this graph just summarizes some of the things I've been saying, and it shows it over time. So you can see, it shows the economy, and you can see the points I made that, you know, the growth was very slow, and then it stagnated. But all the innovation I'm talking about actually occurred at this very, very difficult economic period. And I'm saying it because currently some of the skepticism about UHC is that can low, low and middle income countries in sub-Saharan Africa manage this? My answer is that it's difficult and it's not going to happen overnight. But it's definitely not going to happen if you don't catalyze the energy from within country. That's what I think. <laughs> And this now summarizes the things I've been saying. I've used the horizontal line basically to illustrate that in Ghana, consistently, the focus has been on build the system. If you don't build the system, you won't get very far. Globally, 
things have swung, and this is qualitative. There's nothing quantitative about this. It's just an, an attempt to map it. You can see the swings. You know, the mask, this is the period of the mask. After the establishment of WHO, the period of the mask campaigns, then gradually does the groundswell to Alma Ata, very comprehensive systems. Then the pushback to selective primary health care. Then the MDG, even the MDGs were fairly selective. And now we have the SDG. So my question is that, are we going to stay here or are we going to face the next generation of pushback? And I think if we face the next generation of pushback, we are going to end up with a, a great white elephant rather than a breakthrough. <laughs> my other question is, why have why have you had this difference that the predominant agendas have a selective ideology at global level, whereas at national level, it has a comprehensive approach? I think some of it has to do with incentives, time frames, and ownership. The reality is that the financial of, financiers of global institutions are an important primary reference group. They want measurable results. They want quick wins. Measurable results and quick wins you can get through selective, targeted, vertical programs. On the other hand, development of health services support to bottom up, contextually relevant innovation, capacity building, strengthening <laughs> countries. It's a long term effort and commitment. Measurement is often challenging. How do you, you, some of the things I've talked about, how do you measure them? And then it also requires political and social skills. It requires flexibility and nimbleness to deal with unpredictability. Global institutions and their financiers are also unlike the beneficiary institutions and the citizenry of low and middle income countries. This is my opinion at this stage, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Within country, my observation is that the policy elites are also often unlike the citizenry, that their decisions and priorities as affects. Uh, it's the truth. If you are rich enough in Ghana, you can fly to the US or the UK for care. Uh, I've lived in Nigeria too. It's the same thing. You have enough money, you can escape. And these days, people go to India also. And, and you can get the best of care. So in a way, they are unlike the citizenry that their decisions and priorities affect. However, they are nearer the citizenry and they are nearer the consequences intended and unintended of their actions and inactions. And depending on their degree of absolute control, they have to be aware of domestic unrest. In fact, there's an interesting case study in Grindel and Thomas's book about the devaluation of the Ghana CD in 1971. Policymakers in country were nervous about devaluating the, devaluing the CD. Eventually, they caved in and did a major devaluation. Why they did it after Christmas, I don't know, but they did. A month later, there was a coup. And part of the reason given for the coup was that the devaluation of the CD has made life unpleasant for us. The, the, and the external creditors didn't get their money because the coup makers say we won't pay you. And then they did get it. But then the government was gone. <laughs> Similarly, I've already given the example of the Ghana NHI, and I've said it was driven by local pressure. So these illustrate the points I'm trying to make. So in conclusion, if the patterns of the past are anything to go by, <laughs> The Sustainable Development Goal UHC agenda could prove a major breakthrough, or it could prove a great white elephant for low and middle income countries, depending on the balance between global and country level institutions, ideology, ideas, interests, and related resource priorities. At the global level, there is a potential risk of framing UHC into a narrowly selective agenda. At country level, it's more likely that comprehensive framing and system building approaches will be seen as desirable. However, the capacity to administer, 
financial, human, and other resource constraints reduce the power of low- and middle-income countries and make them vulnerable to pressures to divert their systems to implement well-financed selective global ideas. So to strengthen the chances that UHC is framed and implemented with a strong comprehensive social justice underlying ideology and bottom-up innovation, it will be important to strengthen country leadership and administrative capacity, as well as the interest and the power to shape, own, and lead implementation adapted to context. I would not like to create the impression that all country governments are altruistically interested mm -hmm. in their people. The, you need that social movement to push the governments. Okay. And how can the global community help? In my opinion, the global community needs to focus on catalyzing and supporting locally driven bottom-up change through capacity building and empowerment of local actors to lead and drive change. And the global community has to resist the temptation. It is a big temptation to micromanage national and na subnational level change with global selective approaches, using what my colleague uh, from Niger, Olivia de Sadan, describes as traveling models. He says traveling models are policies and protocols based on miracle mechanisms. They've been taken out of the original context, but they are still believed to be effective. In a complex adaptive system, there are no miracle mechanisms. You have to adapt it to the system. It's the example I gave of rearing a child. Your first child did all his homework, never complained, wonderful child. Your second <laughs> child, you try to manage him or her the same way, and it's a whole big headache because you just can't do it. You have to adapt the principle to the country. Thank you so much. Mm,